You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who Art Ed? Try to spice it. Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood, Art Ed, me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it's a big, it works on so many levels. I know. I thought it was a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, weekly art history for all ages. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and today I want to talk about a little-known story of a painting that caused quite a stir and grabbed headlines a hundred years ago, but few people know about it today. If you want to see an image of the work this week and every week, you can see what I'm talking about if you listen on Amazon Music or anywhere else that supports episode-specific cover art. An artist's skillful application of paint will make an artwork good, but it's a good story that makes artwork great. In 2010, a painting went on auction at Sotheby's and sold for $1.5 million. And I would argue that is not because of the image or the artist, but rather the story. Harry Hahn was an American pilot who fought in World War I. He was fortunate to not only survive the brutal war, but also, while serving overseas, he met the love of his life. He married a French woman named André Lardot. Her aunt, the Comtesse Louise de Monteau, decided to give the young couple one of the old paintings in her collection as a wedding present. The painting was a portrait of a woman. She was believed to have been... Lucrezia Crivelli, apologies on all sorts of mispronunciations with so many names in this, but Lucrezia Crivelli was the mistress of Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan, during the Italian Renaissance. Now, I say she is believed to have been the subject. There are some who say the subject was the mistress of the King of France, And the painting is often referred to simply as a portrait of an unknown woman. Regardless, it was a pretty old portrait. And while these types of old pictures may have been lying around in attics and basements of many aristocratic families across Europe, this type of thing was significantly less common in Junction City, Kansas, where Harry and Andre were living. This gift seemed particularly rare as a French connoisseur by the name of Georges Sauté had examined the painting in 1916, and he had declared it to be the work of none other than Leonardo da Vinci. An original painting by one of the greatest artists of the Italian Renaissance seemed out of place on the wall of their humble home. So the Hans arranged to sell the work to the Kansas City Art Institute for $250,000, the equivalent of around $3.8 million today. Now, to understand this next bit, I need to start by introducing another character in this story, Sir Joseph Duveen. Now, if you ask to the Hans, they would likely say that Duveen was the villain of this piece. To most of the world, though, Mr. Duveen was the ultimate authority on art at that time. In fact, a New York newspaper literally called him, quote, the greatest living authority on art, end quote. Duveen had made quite a business selling art to wealthy American businessmen like J.P. Morgan, Andrew Mellon, and John D. Rockefeller. Duveen famously said, quote, Europe has a great deal of art and America has a great deal of money, end quote. He would buy art from European nobility that had fallen on harder times and then sell it to the newly minted rich in America. In the art market, authenticating works is critical. A dealer doesn't simply sell paintings, drawings, prints, and sculptures. They also sell assurance that the work is as presented. They'll research the provenance, which is the chain of ownership of a work from the time the artist created it up until the present. If there are gaps in the history, it will raise suspicion and experts must closely examine the work to determine if it is the real deal. Mr. Duveen knew and had worked with most of the leading experts in the field. As I said, Duveen was considered the greatest living authority on art. So in 1920, as Harry and Andrea Hahn 
were all set to close the deal and get a six-figure payout from their local museum, a reporter for the New York World newspaper called Duveen up in London to ask his opinion of the American Leonardo, as it was known at the time. Duveen was thousands of miles away and had never actually seen Han's painting, but he was the type to always give a quote to reporters and spoke confidently regardless of his actual expertise in a matter. He declared the actual Leonardo painting of La Belle Fernier was hanging in the Louvre. Duveen said that the Han painting was a mere copy and that, quote, any expert who pronounced it genuine was not an expert, end quote. With that short statement, Sir Joseph Duveen drastically altered the lives of the Han family. Without meeting them or seeing their work, he gave a statement that cost them a quarter of a million dollars. Not only did the Kansas City Art Institute back out of the deal, nobody would pay thousands of dollars for a painting the leading expert called a fake. It didn't help that this was a time when there was a fair amount of skepticism about people claiming to have Leonardo da Vinci paintings. In 1911, the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre, and in the time that it was missing, and for years after that, people would try to pass off fakes as if they were the real thing. In fact, after the original was recovered, a con man told some reporters that he was secretly behind the theft. I guess not so secretly if he was telling it to reporters. But the story he told was that he had the Mona Lisa stolen so that he could sell half a dozen fakes to unscrupulous collectors in the U.S. Of course, it turned out that he was lying about having conspired to steal and commit fraud. That whole story is bonkers, and if you want to learn more about Leonardo, the Mona Lisa, and the theft that turned it from a painting in the museum to an icon of pop culture synonymous with great art, on Monday, August 21st, to coincide with the anniversary of that theft, I'll have an episode with the author of a great new nonfiction book called The Mona Lisa Vanishes, which covers the amazingly improbable events surrounding the creation, theft, and recovery of the Mona Lisa. Lisa. But for now, I want to get back to that Han case. They felt like their lives were ruined by a careless comment from someone who had no way of knowing whether their painting was authentic or not, and they intended to make him pay. While Mr. Duveen's comments had cost the Hans $250,000, Andre Han sought $500,000 in damages as she sued him for slander of title. To break that down, slander is a false statement, typically spoken, as opposed to liable, which is a false statement in writing. But slander is false and defames or harms the reputation of someone else. The slander of title is making a false statement that questions the title to or the authenticity of an artwork. Now, Han went hard trying to make Duveen pay, not only for the financial loss of the opportunity to sell the painting to a museum, but also, I have to imagine it was personal. Her grandfather had bought the painting in the mid-19th century. It had been in the family for decades, and to have a family heirloom declared to be a fake by someone who had never even seen it had to be personally hurtful. For Han and a lot of people following the story, this was about challenging the elite tastemakers, the small circle of insiders who dictated what was and was not great art. The very idea that the value of something could be so dependent upon the word of some man without even the benefit of firsthand knowledge of the piece in question was offensive to a lot of people. I mean, if the value of art can rise and fall by hundreds of thousands of dollars based on one person's offhand comment, what does that say about what people are valuing in the art market? Joseph Duveen, though, decided to make a spectacle of this whole thing. He drove the story in the press. He assembled a panel of leading experts to come to the Louvre, and they brought in the Hans painting so both versions could be examined side by side. 
The whole thing dragged out for years, but in 1929, it finally went to trial. Over four weeks, numerous experts gave testimony for both sides. Interestingly, while they had numerous experts on art history testifying in trial, the jury was actually chosen based on their lack of knowledge of Leonardo da Vinci and the art world more broadly. Newspaper articles from the time described the jurors as an accountant, a salesman, a shirt maker, a man of no vocation. Now, many of Duveen's experts were people who had previously worked with him, and Hans Lawyer actually did a fairly good job of poking holes in their testimony. One of Duveen's experts was quoted saying, quote, I simply look at the Han picture, and the impression produced on my mind is that this is not by Leonardo, end quote. So basically, he has no real facts to back it up. It's just his gut reaction to the piece. It doesn't look right to him. It doesn't feel like a Leonardo to him. In the trial, it came out that some of Duveen's experts had made similar statements questioning the authenticity of the Louvre's version as well. The Hans lawyers, on the other hand, brought in the latest scientific technology. This was among the first uses of x-rays to critically examine a painting. Sorting through all this expert testimony on both sides had to be no easy task. In giving instructions for the jury deliberation, the judge urged them, quote, You'll be wary of accepting the conclusions of experts when such conclusions are not founded upon knowledge, experience, and study. Because a man claims to be an expert does not make him one. End quote. The jurors deliberated, debating amongst themselves for 14 hours, but they were unable to come to a unanimous decision. It was a hung jury. Nine jurors sided with the Hans, and there were three holdouts who were in fact correct. The Hans, as the plaintiffs bringing the lawsuit, had the burden to prove that their painting was in fact an authentic Leonardo da Vinci painting, and they were unable to do that because, as later examination would show us using newer and better forensic technology, the Han painting was a copy created in the 17th century, a hundred years after Leonardo. Of course, that analysis would come in the 1990s, and immediately following the hung jury, Duveen realized that many people found him somewhere between unsympathetic and infuriating, obnoxious, rich, know-it-all snob. He decided to cut his losses and paid the Hans a settlement of $60,000 plus their legal expenses. If you're wondering, adjusting for inflation, that comes out to the equivalent of just over a million dollars today. Pretty solid proof that while a picture may be worth a thousand words, the real money is in the words about the picture. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, and of course on the website whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.